You're listening to the Well Woman Podcast. I'm your host, Gemma Lee, women's menstrual cycle educator, natural fertility coach, and daytime mermaid. This is a place where we discuss all things periods, poo, ovulation, fertility, and sex. Join me weekly as we rediscover our menstrual cycles, unlock its superpowers, and guide you back into your cyclical nature. Tully, welcome back to the Well Woman podcast. Thank you. Yeah, second time around on the Well Woman podcast. <laughs> It wouldn't be too many too many dudes that you've had on twice for this one, surely. No, I've had Timmy on the show. Mm-hmm. Nice. Um and who else? Um, Dr. Vignesh, my Ayurvedic doctor. And then I think maybe one other in the whole four and a half years I've been running the podcast. So you're a you're from a small selection. I'm honored. A private small selection. Honored, yeah. <laughs> and for very good reason. Like <laughs> In the intro, we share about your previous episode um, and for very good reason. And I'm so grateful that you're here to be a part of the pregnancy series because like we were chatting about before we hit record, like this particular topic about becoming a father or becoming a father again and the transition in the lead up, like that whole 10 months of prep before, holy fuck, there's a baby here. Mm. That's not really talked about from the lens of of men, is it? So before we jump into it, because we'll rant on that for a long time, let's just hear a bit about you. And your father, you know, your fathering as a father and how that happened for you and what it is that you do with your life. Mm -hmm. Um, So people can get a bit of context of who they're listening to, because you really are the best person to listen, talk about this. I've (laughs) got big, big shoes to fill now. Um, Yeah. So I'm like a father of two. Um, My second is 10 weeks old today, two little boys. Um, Yeah. That's been, it's something I've always wanted to do. Like I I knew I'd be, I'd, I was very intentional about my um, entrance into fatherhood. It's from when I was like young, I was something that I was like looking forward to. Um, and yeah, I work in the coaching space, have been in this space for seven, eight years. And that's kind of been balanced between working with um, mainly couples and then men, lots of men's work, like retreats, men's coaching programs. Mm. Um, so yeah, I've definitely got my personal experience of the challenges and the the humbling experience that fatherhood is. Um, And then I've also had the privilege of, I guess, getting a sneak peek into lots and lots and lots of other men's um, and couples experience of fatherhood and and parenthood. Um, So that's kind of, yeah, what I bring to the things that I share and and that I offer. And your program Liberating Love is amazing. I, the amount of women that reach out to me after that program, just to like ask me a question on Instagram, um, because I guess speak in the program, it's such a, from what I see and what I hear, it's such a phenomenal like regrouping and reframing, you know, a whole repattern of their mm. relationship occurs during that time frame. And so becoming a father isn't just like, okay, so what are my responsibilities and roles as a father? It's actually like, how do I turn up as me and give to me? And then how do I turn up in my relationship? So I'm giving to the relationship and, you know, whatever you want to call it, becoming the mountain or being the mountain, like my friend Ryan, our friend Ryan calls it. Mm. Mm. Or being the father of a child all of a sudden. So there's many little pockets mm. in that. There's yeah, there's so many. And it's um I love the the way you laid it out because that's really important. And it's where I see a lot of guys come unstuck, is they miss the first part of that equation that you mentioned, and that was them. Right. <laughs> them in them of, of themselves, how they're showing up for themselves and how they're showing up in their relationship and then how they're showing up for baby, right? And so many guys, and when we spoke about this before we hit record, like once the pregnancy is there, it's like, whoa, and then like provider mode gets kicked in and it can be really intense and it can be a lot of... um unconscious providing like what do i got to do and then the typical is like okay provide financially like provide like that's that's my role that's what i saw dad do that's what the you know conversation amongst society in general is like the man provides that and that's an important part um but it's just one piece of the puzzle and where i see a lot of guys come unstuck is a they forget about themselves so they end up burning out and getting resentful can work in the short term putting yourself last, um, but doesn't work in the long term. And 
Um, and then just not having a broad enough definition of providing. Like mm. what's actually required in this transition for your partner, for baby, for yourself, for the family, what's actually required. And then that's how we should be looking at what needs providing. Like, and money is obviously a part of it, you know, paying bills and having a safe space and having nutritious food and the things that you need money for. Yes. Um, but there's a lot more to it, which I'm sure we can yeah, dive into and unpack a little bit. Let's go there because I'm just thinking of fatherhood and role modeling, right? So like generally, this is very like generalization, extreme generalization here is that, you know, we father or we mother the way that we were mothered or the way mm. that we were fathered. And we live in a very different world, you know, like I'm born in the eighties. I don't know what era you're born in, but like, yeah, late eighties very different compared to like the fathering back then is very different to now. And Mm -hmm. we know more now and it's not that they did it the wrong way. They just did it the way that they knew how to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're wiser. We're also older, but like we're actually wiser as a society now. And so providing and becoming a father is so much more than just the seed of the sperm Mm -hmm. and go to work, have a good job, get paid, have a mortgage and let's provide for a family. So you said like, it's a broad definition. So let's talk about how is the old fathering impacting us now, which I'm sure you've Mm. got lots to say on, uh, particularly Mm -hmm. around relationships and Mm -hmm. how we care for ourselves as men. Like I know I'm not a man, but like how men now care for themselves as opposed to what they could still be like, what they could do. Like there's lots of opportunity there compared to just mirroring what they once were taught. So what is that broad definition? And there's lots of little pockets of conversation in there. Mm, yeah, there's so much there. Um, just reiterating what you said around our parents, like there was a different era. Because and I speak to this in the relationship course because this, this is where we get our models for relationship as well, not just for parenting, um, is that most people, uh, not most people, a lot of people maybe had role models or modelling that they're not that stoked on. They're like, mm. they did the best they could with what they had and I don't really want to recreate that in my relationship or my experience of parenting. And even if you had a good role model, even if you were like, oh, my God, my parents were amazing. They had an amazing relationship. They parented amazing, um, beautiful. They were doing it in very different times. Totally. Very different stresses. And so even if you did have a good model, which a lot of people didn't, it still doesn't really, some things apply but we still need to um, learn what is required in this day and age to thrive as a family unit, as you become a family unit. So no matter which way you slice it, there's um, learning to be done, right? And decisions to be made and and approaching it intentionally is the only way, Um, in my opinion. Like it's just things have changed too much in terms of the amount of stress families are under, the pace of life, social media, like all these extra stresses that our parents did not have to contend with, we do. And mm. so, um, yeah, to bringing that into the perspective that, that is shaping our experience of that transition into parenthood is really important. Um, so that's that, just a little rant on, on the different, the different um, seasons. Um, but with providing, for me, it's about... Like providing financially is like one pillar. Like we, that's like the physical providing. We also need to provide, like how are we providing mentally, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, like all of the different pots, right? We get to, we are impacting the family. Yeah. And this can, might sound a bit heavy, but sometimes it needs to. In all those different areas, we're either an asset or a liability. Mm, like that. Very logical for men. Yeah. Yeah, it's like we can spreadsheet this. Right? Emotionally, relationally, am I an asset or a liability? Right? Am I aware enough of my own emotional makeup, my partners, my what level of self awareness do I have? All of these things will either make me an asset or a liability. And the goal as a provider is to become an asset in all of these different areas. Right? And so with a real focus on that emotional and like physical health because it's so deeply linked um but expanding our awareness of what's going on for us internally 
exploring our own reactivity, all of these things is the single most important thing you can do, in my opinion. Mm. Um, yes, providing financially and all of that. Um, and that's almost like there's, there's a lot of different ways because some people have different um, setups. It's not just sole provider and all of those things. But normally, even if you've shared that, normally there's going to be, depending on what the woman wants to do and how they want to mother and that maybe they've got a business or whatever. So there's lots of different ways it can look. But generally there's going to be a period where like that rests on the shoulders of the man for a short or maybe really long time, depending on what you decide as a team. And that's kind of like a, a given in my book. Like that's just, that has to happen. And then the other stuff, it needs to be chosen more intentionally. Um, and so there's that sort of emotional, the EQ, right? Becoming an asset there. And then relationally as well. Um, typically, again, it's a generalization. Um, and my, my, it's from experience working with hundreds of couples as well. So like it, I'm not just making it up, but generally the woman will have more of a focus on the relationship and will maybe be more proactive in seeking out support or, or those kinds of things um, than the man will be. Again, not a, not a rule. I have lots of men that come to me and they're initiating things for the couple. But if, if, you, are, if you do sit in that camp where you're like, she remembers that we need to go on a date, she remembers like, it's, and that has been outsourced, then that's something to just be aware of as well. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit on expanding our definition of providing um, because like we want to win. We want to do a good job. We want to look after our family. And a lot of the time we, we think we know what that looks like and we're missing a few pieces. So what I see happen a lot for guys is like, okay, this is what I have to do. I'm going to do it and I'm going to burn out doing it because I want to do it so bad. Like there's very rarely a lack and so of well. Want to do it so yeah, well. Yeah, I want to do the thing. I want to do the thing for the people I love. Like, And then so when that's, if you're missing these things, like the emotional part, the relational part, you will end up with a dissatisfied partner. So if I've tried my hardest to provide self-sacrifice and then after a couple of years, I have a partner that's dissatisfied for various reasons, that hits pretty hard. And that's when resentment can build and yada, yada. And it goes both ways. So this isn't a, on, I don't think this is the man's responsibility. I think this is a couple's responsibility. What does this look like? What do I think I will need? What do I think you will need? What will we need? That needs to be a conversation. Like let's define as a team what providing looks like in this season and set yourselves up to win so that you're both speaking the same language. Because you might think, I've got to earn all this money to buy this expensive pram and do all this stuff because I think my wife will want it. And then she actually doesn't give a shit and she would rather you take an extra two months off and use that money for that. Like, so has the, has these things been discussed? Mm, I think this is such an important topic because for me, when I work with clients on preconception care is that this is a really important point, like, and part of the process. Yeah. It's important to understand your cycle and to know, like, do you have healthy sperm? Do you have healthy ovulation is, you know, conception physically possible, but also I'm a really big believer in the spiritual and energetic connection of conception and that for both parties to be on the same page when they come together in a relationship to create life, that having all of these conversations beforehand is really important. And mm -hmm. I encourage couples to, you know, write a list of things that you love doing that you don't think you could do with children and then relook over that list and look at, well, what could we do with a child? And then what do we really want to do without a child? Mm. Yeah, and there's naturally going to be a list, like a crazy, ridiculous hike that you want to do that would be really hard carrying a, <laughs> you know, a toddler on your back the whole way, mm -hmm. you know, 22 kilometers or something. Mm -hmm. um, but exploring that, more than just the physical things you can do, like, okay, where are we financially and where mm. are we sitting in the emotional scale? And I call it relationship development. So like, can we get someone to support us in how we communicate? So I understand what you're saying and you understand what I'm saying so that when this shit blows up, when we have a child and we throw another, a big, beautiful spanner in the works that, cause it is big and beautiful, but it is a spanner in the works that you come together with, a better understanding of each other as opposed to like having a go at each other. So these are really, really important. And I, I think from a male's perspective, going back to like what I've mentioned first, like putting you first, mm. 
Mm. And this is something Brent and my partners, he loves his own alone time. Mm-hmm. And he's very aware that like, okay, when we have a child, the alone time is going to be a little bit lower mm-hmm. than what it's previously been. If I just have the weekend to myself. So why is it so important for men to actually do things on their own or have alone time, whether that's them going and being with their friends, and then coming back to the family unit or filling up their own cup, whether that's, you know, it could be anything, surfing, mm-hmm. fishing, reading a book, journaling, doing a workshop, why is that actually still really important in the process of becoming a father and then as a father? Mm, yeah, um, so good. A few things, um, like the immediate ones are just in terms of decompression and nervous system regulation. Like um, we have different capacities to handle things, right? And so much shifts hormonally for women during this time that makes them more capable. It's still super hard, obviously, but like more capable to handle the lack of sleep, the lots of touch, the ever presence of this little thing, right? And it's been shown that these hormonal shifts can happen for men, not to the same extent, but depending on the amount of quality present time they have with child, um, skin to skin contact with the baby, um, all of these different things, these hormonal shifts can be... um, will will happen but just not to the same extent and if for whatever reason men don't get that because it's an environmental stimulus for men it's an internal stimulus for the woman so it happens Great no matter separation. what you're, you're birthing so some men might only get a week off and then they're working long hours or so they're not having the environment that sets up the hormonal change that makes that bonding easy and and effortless and all of that so those things can be harder for the men they don't have to be but they can be And then often that needing that time away apart um, helps with that decompression. And so the biggest thing that I have learned, a bit of a side note tangent, but we'll come back in my three and a half years of parenting is it's about quality, not quantity of time. If I'm there all day, every day, but I'm a agitated jerk, it's good for nobody, right? If I'm there a little bit less, but I'm happier and more regulated, that's the win, right? Um, so, so there's that as well. Um, I think the other thing is there's there's pockets, right? Like immediately postpartum, right? Like the first month, especially uh, having two, there was zero Tully time for that first month. I gave myself the month. I was like, cool do what you got to do. (laughs) But then I know, yeah, yeah, do it. Like we can do a lot more than we think we're capable of. But then it's like, okay, after that point, some self-care needs to come back in. And then a little bit more. Because what happens is I see guys, I'll be working with a guy that's their kids are six or something. And they just gave it up at that point because they genuinely needed to. That was the right call for that time. But it's very easy to not pick it up again. Because it's not like you have the busy month postpartum and then life's not busy anymore. It's like it just gets busier. So things get given away. Once you're right, in it, you're in it. Right. So so. Undo it. Yeah. 100%. Like, so put mum first. Rightly so. That's what we should be doing. Put baby first. Rightly so. That's what, that's what we should be doing. But at some point, we need to work ourselves back into that equation. We, it just has to happen. Um, how it looks. And then, because then the question is, what needs to happen so that I can do that? So we need to get creative because if we're just like, oh, there's no time, that's a, just a poor excuse. And it's a, it's a real one, but in the world of infinite possibilities, is there a chance that something could happen, some form of support could show up, something could shift in the way our week looks so that you could have an hour to go for a run? Like, I think in the world of infinite possibilities, you can make that happen, half an hour, whatever it may be. So, yeah, working that back in because this is a really long tangent, um, but it's I read, a long book, tangent. I read a book called The Boy Crisis and he speaks about all the challenges that are facing young boys with young boys' mental health, like literacy, graduate, like and all the stats across the board, young boys not looking flash, right? And they're exploring some of the things contributing to that. And one of them was dad deprivation. So either physically not having dad around, like there's lots of households that don't have a dad, 
and or um, dad not being there emotionally, right? Because you can never be there physically, but not there emotionally. And one of the things they spoke about in this book was, does dad have a sparkle in his eye? Is dad alive, right? Is dad exuding any sort of passion for life, right? Because little kids absorb this stuff. And so what guys often do, they might have a purpose or a passion. And then as soon as they have a child, they're like, okay, completely cutting that off. My only purpose is to provide for this family. And although noble on the outset, if you completely are self-sacrificial ongoing from there, what are you actually modeling? What are you actually going to be give, be able to give to that family other than the paycheck or whatever it might be? And so maintaining a tether of something to things in life, time with friends, surfing, whatever it might be, that keeps the sparkle in the eye is more of a gift to our families than we give it credit for. Mm. Um, and so just like treating it with that importance is I think is really key. And then going back to the communication piece that we touched on earlier, having this, it becomes a team decision. If we're like, cool, what's our long-term game plan? Like treating our family like a business, right? What's our game plan? What do we, what, what do we want to create? Let's spreadsheet here? this. Yeah, 100%. And then it's like, oh, it becomes silly to cut it out. You're like, oh, what a ridiculous idea that neither of us are doing things for ourselves on a given week. Like, and so... I find guys experience a lot of guilt to do that. So they avoid the conversation. And to be honest, depending on how challenging postpartum is, the level of fatigue, they might try to bring it to the table. Maybe they don't do it in the most effective way. It's often not met very well because mm. then you have mum who is proper burnt out, breastfeeding, and they're like, you want what? You want some time out? Like, I need time out. Like, and so it's often actually not met very well. Like I've had a lot of guys that bring it up. And again, there's, there's ways you can bring it up and talk about it effectively, but it's often not met well. So then they're like, oh, I tried. I said I wanted to go for a surf. She wasn't, didn't want me to. And then they just hang up that hat and cue resentment building over time. And that's often where a lot of couples find me three years down the track. And they're like, there's just these micro resentments that have been stacked over time. Um, I think that's the end of my rant. <laughs> Great rant. And by the time they come to see you, they're at the point of like, we're either divorcing right now or you're yeah. going to make this work for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love what you said about like the whole spread, like the spreadsheeting and making it like a business is that imagine if you knew this before you got to the point of postpartum mm -hmm. where you're like, this is all fucking happening to me. You've got no fucking idea what is going on. Yeah. I have it harder. No, I have it harder. Like it's a competition, right? It, and it's a, the race to the bottom, I call it. Like we're, mm, we're like both that. burnt out, fatigued. We don't appreciate or acknowledge each other enough. So we're both jockeying for the victim position. Because if I have it the hardest, that means I get the support or the time that mm. we're both fighting over. And so it's this real common unconscious pattern that we just need to be able to see. Um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's very, very common. And I think this is, um, I don't want to say, you know, women are guilty of this, but I think there's a big, like women can be very guilty of the fact that, well, this is happening in my body and you don't even know, like this will never yeah. be your experience. And yeah. I remember having a rant to Brenton probably, you know, <laughs> in the middle of the the first trimester or maybe like week 10, week 11 or something, you know, it was a whole month and he was away traveling for 22 days of the month and he comes home from traveling, you know, and it's all work stuff and he's working like 12, 14 hour days. And he's just like, I just want the day to myself. And I know all of this stuff we're talking about. And I'm just like, if he doesn't come back being the most supportive partner ever, I'm going to wring his neck. And having the conversation about you're never going to know what it's like to not know how to describe how you feel and have things come up and just not know what to do. And that's always where I think in that moment, it's a really great time to recognize that if you can practice this before pregnancy or during pregnancy, that, okay, this is your alone time and this is my alone time that that can really instill good habits for when you've had the child. And my outlook on that is that, and I'm grateful that I'm having, you know, my first birth child at 37 and not 27 for the hindsight of, you know, my wise years. 
But when it comes to birthing now, I'm very appreciative of my own alone time whilst being pregnant, knowing that I might not get many moments of this for the next couple of years, potentially. Mm. And so just going to do something because I feel like doing it, not because oh I could do that with a child and, you know, can I pack the car quickly <laughs> enough to like get to the beach before it gets windy and, and mm-hmm. I think because I'm taking advantage of those moments and it make it makes, you know, fills my cup up, I'm encouraging him to do the mm-hmm. same. And I think mm-hmm. if we can practice this before we're in the depth of it, it's like establishing yourself with really good skills and good habits for a relationship. And I love your expression of decompression because that's when things are at the boiling point and that's when mm-hmm. you're like, okay, you need to step away. I need to step away. Then how do we come back? So mm. you mentioned a great book. What was it about boys? Oh, the boy crisis. Boy crisis. Is there any other good reading materials um, mm. or courses like Liberating Love? Or, <laughs> um, anything else that you have found beneficial or that you've read since becoming a father to Raph that you're like, actually, that would have been really helpful before? Mm, good question. <laughs> Um, Crack in your not brain really. Now. Yeah. I read uh, like a couple of like parenting books or, or fathering books and I mean, they were fine. Um, but nothing that I was like, yes, this is it. Um, a lot of it has been like little bits collected from all over the place. Um, so yeah, I couldn't put, I mean, I've got a podcast that people can go and listen to. And the whole reason I started that podcast was for this exact reason. I didn't Perfect. see anything in kind of like one space. So I'm sure you can like link that up. It's called Thriving in Fatherhood. Um, but, but yeah, it's it's not, and I think that's the hard thing for guys is um, it's not simple. It's not like, hey, here's the roadmap, right? You need to sort of like figure it out yourself. Um, and which is something that guys like to do. They're like, oh, solve this problem on my own right I'll, I'll figure it out um but that can pose its own difficulties as well mm. because like one thing that i learned especially the transition in fact this was initiated both times was this idea of receptivity and letting the lone wolf letting the hero in me take his cape off right because i couldn't do it all right like I couldn't be the be all and end all for cat and learning that, accepting that, celebrating that like allowed us to thrive because I was open to receiving support in the form of God knows what um, everything. Like I, I went in on it because I saw it as something that I was like, Oh, like leading up to the Rafi's birth, we had people like, oh, like I can cook for you. I can do this. What do you need help with? And I was like, no, no, no. I'm like, our business was set up so I could take lots of time off. So I was like, I'm good. I've got it. And then I just had this realization that like all these people in our community are wanting to help and I'm refusing it. I'm like, how ass backwards is that? Like what's going on there? Um, and so I went, flipped the script and I just started saying yes to absolutely everything. And then, actually practicing asking for help as well um and it was super uncomfortable but it was life-changing it was life-changing the meal train we had like the amount of support we had it was like oh i i it was this funny acceptance of i'm not enough you know how like the root core wound of everybody is like oh i'm not enough like totally it's it was making peace with the fact that i i'm not right (laughs) And like, that we can't be. Yeah. In all things. Yeah. And it's like, I'm not supposed to be. And it's, yeah. So it completely reframed things for me, um, which, yeah, I think is a really important thing to add into this conversation is like, you are not enough for your partner. Like for all the emotional ups and downs, for all of the everything, you won't be enough to hold it all. You can try, right? And trust, like I literally spent my life, I was working in this field for years leading up to it and I was just humbled time and time again. And it was like, oh, she needs her girlfriends for this. And so what my role became was, is zooming out and almost feeling into or sensing or intuiting, like, what do we need? What does the family need right now? What do I need? I need some space. Like, what does cat need? And ensuring that that was kind of happening. 
rather than just try to be the fixer of all the problems. It's almost like rather than being a worker, it's like zoom out and be CEO. Like what needs to happen in this rather than just trying to be like do the actual fixer. Yeah, like you don't have to scrub every toilet and do everything. Like um, you need to be aware of what you can do, aware of your own limitations. Another huge one. Guys don't want to admit that they've got limitations. So like, sure, I'll hold space for you. Yet they're not in a place to do it authentically or well. And so and it just probably never know well. how to. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like they're trying to listen and trying to be empathetic and they just don't have the capacity to. So knowing that you don't have the capacity to, voicing that and figuring out what you can do. Like maybe you need couples therapy. Like maybe you get a therapist for monthly for the first six months postpartum. Like maybe, you know what I mean? Like making sure she's got her girlfriends, like friends of ours just birthed recently. And they that was the message. Like one of them, um, the man was like, oh, yeah, I'm getting to my capacity with what I can hold. Like I'm holding up the household. I'm doing all of this stuff. She needs more support. Can you and Kat come around? So Kat can be with her and you and me can take the boys to the park. So it's like that's leadership. That's providing in my interpretation and understanding of it. Um, so, yeah, going, going off on another bit of a rant from that receptivity piece is when we're, because when, guys want to, again, provide, set up the structures, all the practical, A, celebrate that. It's like that's important too. And it's like, what else is required? And you're part of the equation. Like, what are you, what are you going to need? Mm. Um, and I think the biggest thing, and, and you spoke about the relational development, and because as much as it, it's amazing to have these conversations ahead of time and proactively, like it's so good to do. And you're going to birth, you're going to be two months postpartum, and it's going to be like a bomb went off and none of those conversations happen. And you're going to have to regroup and you're going to have to like speak about it and you're going to have to change plan probably every week, right? Because that's a great plan and now baby's teething. We need a new plan <laughs> this week. an up level every few And months. then we need a new weeks. plan again and then we need a new plan again. And so um, plan, do, review, I say. It's like you need to okay. have pockets where you can come together, set an intention, like have a bit of a plan for the week and have some flexibility with it and then like being able to review like oh that doesn't work anymore like that's not applicable anymore i can't that 30 minutes of self time i was getting before baby woke up baby's waking up two hours earlier okay where am i going to get that pocket now for this coming week like we need to be flexible um and that requires communication and i find a lot of the things that um can stifle that is when there's these unexpressed resentments or anything so when these things that are seemingly meaningless like get brought to the table they can erupt for no reason because there's these it's the pot simmering and and then we're burnt out so um yeah it's as much as we need to have the prep talk like what's our plan going to be it's more develop the practice and the understanding that we do this regularly this is part of who we be and who we are and how we operate in our relationship. Um, that's more important. Like the, the skill set identity shift of like how I show up in relationship and what's required. Um, yeah. Is really, really important. And there's no permanent, like nothing is permanent. So once you make a plan, that's not forever. It's just a right now. And I think a lot of us forget that nothing is permanent and we, we want things to be permanent. <laughs> so much easier. Right. Can't we just have the chat and then do the We're thing? We're done and we can just yeah. do <laughs> And then the chat never has to happen again. Can't we just move past that? And I want to add in a slice of um, of guilt here for a lot of women, I think, is that it's really important to help recognize that if you're in a heterosexual relationship, particularly when there's, you know, stereotype roles in place, you don't have to force your partner to do all the things. Yeah, and I think a lot of women are like, well, that's your role. You're supposed to look after this. I'm looking after the fucking baby and the breastfeeding and the fucking knife feeds and you can't do any of that. Like only I can do that. Only I'm the one with the boobs and so you should be doing this. And I think, you know, not that I'm at that stage yet because I don't have a baby (laughs) yet, but um, I think from what I've seen in a lot of women who do hold a lot of resentment and then that builds up in other ways in their life is that we also as a woman, I'm putting, I'm saying we, we also need to be aware that 
men can't do all of that either. And just like we need a community and support, so do they. Mm-hmm. And um, I think from looking at, you know, close male brothers in my life, that's probably one of the hardest things to form because there's so much promotion about female community and motherhood community when really where is the essence of fatherhood and Mm -hmm. men getting together with their children potentially too, to explore the growth of that. And Mm -hmm. the last slice I'll add to that is the trying to fix things or trying to like problem solve. And, you know, I'm in my six month of pregnancy as we record this now, and I've been through the phase of, everything's changing in my body and none of my clothes fit me. And (laughs) what the fuck? Like all the things I would normally do to make me feel better. I can't do all of those anymore. And so I've been through that and, you know, I was just having my own process, like fully moving through that myself. And Brenton really came to the table and was like, Hey, like I want to sit and I want to listen to you. And I was like, under the proviso that you can't do anything. This is just a space hold. Yeah. Like you can't change me. You can't tell me I'm beautiful. You can't buy me new clothes. Like none Mm. of that is ultimately going to work. This is part of the death of my menarch that I need to experience to become the mother I need to be or the have the birth I need to have. And I think there's the two parts that are really played out there that most people don't see is that I can't force him to go and make all the money and take more time off work and do all the things without him receiving. And I also have to learn to receive from a space Mm -hmm. being held, like where I'm being held. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. So much, so much gold there. Um, Yeah. I say that we either get good at proactively expressing our needs and desires or we reactively express our resentments. Oh, I like that. It's one or the other. And most people, men and women alike for different reasons, some similar reasons are pretty shit at a recognizing their needs, their actual needs. Yep. Um, and then expressing them and asking for them in an effective way. Mm. Most people are like, I've, I've voiced my needs, but it was like mid fight and you were shouting. Projective. Like, that's not expressing a fucking need, right? That's just being completely like, so recognizing them and expressing them in an effective way. These are skills that we can learn and we better learn them if we want to be affecting, effective, loving parents, right? Because otherwise we just get eaten alive. It's just so, such a gnarly experience you know even if you've got all the skills and the tools that that has to happen on both sides um so that's the first thing and then um the second thing oh i've lost it trying to not solve i mentioned trying to not solve oh yeah the fact that um like differentiating like the story that we're telling and the experience that we're having from it being a fact so the, this goes back to the race to the bottom. We've both got this idea, especially when we're fatigued, when we're sleep deprived, we're going to be pretty much living in fight or flight, essentially, which pretty much means live, operating from our deepest conditioning. So all our mummy, daddy stuff that we judge them for and da-da-da, we're going to be playing out and, yeah, not having a great time, right? And so when we're in that, we, we've got our versions of the way things are. This is the way things are. I'm doing all this. He or she is only doing all this and this is the way things are. Both people have their version of the way things are. Neither of those are correct, right? Somewhere in the middle, right? There's this, there's this truth, right? But understanding, but that doesn't make their experience any less valid because what happens, and I've seen this, we've had this, like Kat and I have had heaps of talks about this, whereas she would be feeling resentful and then feel guilty about feeling resentful because she can see how much I'm doing. So then she's in this weird resentment, guilt, shame soup of just like feeling horrendous. And if that goes on long enough, you just explode. And so learning to, from both sides, hold space for, listen to, be with, whatever language you want to use, our partner's upset and our own upset without attaching to it. That so, skill. oh, so much skill and it's so hard, but it's possible. And, and even if you only get this right one time out of 10, you're probably going to transform your relationship. Like you don't need to become perfect, masterful, you know, never fuck it up communicators to significantly transform your relationship. But it, it can look like, or 
understanding resentment. And then it can look like rather than, okay, so there's this, there's, there's layers to it, right? There's you never do X, right? So that's the story that I'm telling. You never, you don't care, right? You don't care. What are the stories we tell? And then it's the feeling beneath that is maybe resentment, right? So then it's like, I'm feeling resentful. So that's taking a little bit more responsibility. Yep. And then the next layer on that is, and you can just use this sentence starter. This can be a game changer. So write this down if you're listening. The story I'm telling myself is X. So rather than you don't care, you da 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 da, the story I'm telling myself right now is you don't care and X and Y. This is what's happening for me. These are the emotions I'm experiencing. I'm feeling resentful. I'm feeling all of this. I'm not saying any of it is the way. Like, I love you. I know you're doing your best. But it, we, then, then that can be expressed so it doesn't get recycled. It doesn't get expressed. It gets recycled. So then if we can create a space where that, it's like, I'm feeling resentful too. Hey, we're both feeling resentful, right? And simultaneously, we both love each other. Like, so creating a space so those narratives don't get suppressed mm. is, is so important. And the caveat I'll add to that is it doesn't have to be within your relationship. It's amazing when it can be, but let's just say a couple's listening to this and they're pretty stressed at the moment. Things aren't going well. Communication isn't great. To bring that kind of dialogue in can be quite challenging without support. So then have other people in your corner, have your girlfriends, have your guy friends, have a counselor, have somebody that you can go and say, hey, I'm actually, it's weird because I know I can see she's breastfeeding all night, da, 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 but I'm feeling really resentful about X, Y, and Z. And then this person can say, oh, that's fair enough that you're feeling that way. Let's, un- we'll, we'll, we can unpack it a bit. But then all of a sudden the charge around it dissolves because it's like, oh, I feel seen. I'm acknowledged in this. And, and, and then we can start to work with it. Whereas if we don't do that and we think we can just, or I shouldn't be feeling resentful, so I won't say anything or do anything. It's like that's a, a ticking time bomb. Yeah, you can only bury the bomb so far until it blows up in your face. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, and it's mm-hmm. um, I think just normalizing the struggle and going back to um, like what you shared about the, the women that have reached out to you after doing liberating love is doing this work in that group dynamic does this in a big way it normalizes the challenge. Like imagine See everyone else a, doing similar you, things. Yeah. So you're in a room or in a zoom room, right? Virtual. And I ask the question, who's feeling resentful of their partner and every single hand goes up or who has felt resentful. of, And it's like, Oh, all of this stuff that I'm attaching to and projecting and da da da. It is normal considering the season. It's completely normal. And so knowing that, how do we work with it rather than internalizing it? Oh, this is my stuff. This is him. This is her. And it's like, no, it's not. It's every parent in the history of parenting. Like it's, you know, like it, it allows us to distance ourselves from the challenge so we can work with it rather than be just so caught up in it and not being able to see the forest through the trees, so to speak. I love that analogy. And I think it's, it's the same as like when women go, oh, so I feel the same about my menstrual cycle. Oh, we all feel the same about our menstrual cycle. Why don't it's, we talk about this? It's, it's just bringing it to light that you're actually completely normal and mm-hmm. you're having a human experience, which is normal. So how can we learn to manage that experience and to amplify the experience for next time? Mm-hmm. 100%. It removes the shame, especially with parenting and relationship. There can be a lot of shame. Like we like it is humbling. We will react in ways that we are not stoked with to our partner, to our kids. And if we can't voice that, and I've had that many conversations on my podcast with men who are good men, embodied men, have done the work, they're doing the work, and they've shared stories around reactions they've had with their children that they are deeply shameful about. And I've since I ask every dad pretty much I have a deep conversation with now, like have you had an experience like this? And I haven't found one that hasn't, that hasn't reacted in a way with their children that they don't carry some shame around. And, but knowing that, knowing every single other father has had that experience all of a sudden, ah, oh, okay, I'm still going to do something about it. It doesn't make it okay that I did that, but I'm not going to sit in the shame spiral and just fester in it. We get to proactively move forward. Like the same thing happens in relationship. And 
um, yeah, I feel like that shame piece uh, is, yeah, there's just so, so much bullshit about like happy families. Hey, how are you going? Yeah, good. We're all good. And like then they're drowning Bubble, behind yeah. the scenes. Yeah. And it's just that's got to stop. <laughs> and that's where, you know, there's so much that has, oh, I've seen in my past about people who you think is just so good together and then all of a sudden they're split. separated and you're like, what? Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah. Like you guys had a great relationship. And you're like, actually, yeah. no, it was all this other shit going on. I was just like, why mm. didn't you talk to us? You know, it's like, yeah, yeah I think um, we're out of that 80s, 90s, 70s, 60s, 50s, whatever it is, phase where we don't just have to keep all our shit at home mm-hmm. and that we can ask for help in other ways, whether mm. that's paying for a therapist, like you mentioned, or expressing and actually bringing up the topic of conversation with others. And that's why it's so enriching for men to have, male friends and Mm -hmm. females to have female friends and yes females can have male friends and males can have female (laughs) friends I get that too I've one of my best mates is a male but I really think that the relationing between same sex and similar experiences is unmatched a different level of empathy is is accessible like yeah yeah it's um yeah I agree like you can I mean you can take you can use a journal. There's a million different ways you can do it. It's just like, what's more effective? Me going to a female friend to speak about fatherhood challenges or uh, a father that's 10 years down the journey ahead of me? Like what's going to be more effective? So it's not, yeah, good, bad, right or wrong, but it's like, yeah, what's a more effective way to do it? And I've found Mm. like men having other men around and women having other women around is a pretty fail-safe option. Um, And I would would just say necessary. I'd say if you don't have it in some capacity, you're going to struggle. And so if you don't have it, cultivate it um, in some way, shape or form. Something you can definitely work towards. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, And grow and build for yourself. Okay. We could go on so many topics and rants, but I do want to ask the question about preparation for birth. Mm. I know you have been part of two home births Mm -hmm. and I think there's nowhere near enough prep information out there of men, you know, preparing for the birth mm-hmm. because there's so much for the woman. Yeah. And yes, you can go do a hypnobirthing course and you can work with a midwife or an obstetrician or whatever your choices are in birth, mm-hmm. but also you can't do the birth. Yeah. So what would you, like, what advice would you give for those who are listening to this, whether that's the man listening to this or a partner mm-hmm. who's going to pass this on to the, to the man or, you know, a, a, just a random male who's like, I might be your dad in 10 years time. Who knows? Yeah. What would you recommend for, for mm. men in preparation for birth? Yeah. What could you do? Like, what did you do? Cool. So we, um, great question, by the way, because there's so much of the prep in the, I found in the man's brain is often about what's going to happen after birth, which is super important, but it's like, that's, and, and yes, what we need for birth, but it's more like, okay, time off things we're going to need Is that because you can plan that structure. whereas you can't plan the actual birth yeah and i think like you can have guys, an idea of it but well and guys have no idea like if, if unless a guy has guy friends that have especially if you're wanting to home birth or even if you're not but especially if you are who've been in that experience before there's no way to know what that is going to be like right so um what we did and this is what i recommend if you if it's accessible for you is do some sort of structured preparation unless you're ridiculously proactive. Um, but I find like you've mentioned um, your partner's gone into this like hyper provider mode and just like often we don't have lots of spare time. We're usually filling up our time with things. And so sometimes this part of the preparation can slip through the crowd. Oh yeah. I, I read that article you sent me and da 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 da. We, we did a hypnobirthing course, um, so with a lady back in WA, shout out Philippa Kelly. Um, she was our doula as well. Um, and that was amazing because that was a time, and we did it in person, but, but she does it, you can do it online. Um, designated time for us and our preparation for birth. And committing to that meant I didn't have to give that mental space anymore. Mm. So it was, it was amazing. And so it, just having that, us as a team are preparing for the birth. So we became like that shifted things, even no matter what we learned, even if we didn't learn anything that would have shifted things for us. 
because of the the intention that it sets and the decision that we've made as a mm. team. Um, so there's that. But then within that, learning about the physiology of birth, and I guess like I've got a background as a physiotherapist and so all of that stuff really landed, made perfect sense, was quite fascinating. And I, because I wasn't opposed to home birth at all, but like say if Kat didn't suggest a home birth and we just got pregnant, like I probably wouldn't have been like, hey, let's home birth at that point. Um, I wasn't overly opposed to it either, but I was like, hmm, okay, like let me learn more. <laughs> this is also so, out of my control. It, it, so was, so, it I... was so different. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know anyone that had done it. Um, but I was, yeah, super open. But anyway, then learning about the physiology of birth, what's required in terms of relaxation, how important the environment is and all of this stuff. And I'm like, you are tripping if you think the best place to give birth is in a hospital. And again, this is a personal opinion and there's complications and other things and et cetera. And it gave me great confidence in the fact that, oh, this is a good option for us. And so that was, if there's any hesitation, because a lot of guys, if they don't have experience, are probably like, should we be doing this at home? Like, is this, I support you, babe. But so they're carrying these. It's the safest thing to do. Yeah. Are you going to be safe? Yeah. So they're carrying their fears and they bring that into the space. So being honest about any fears or hesitation you have is really important and having a space to do that is really important. And again, that may be with your partner. It may not be, right? If you've got a really good doula or birth support person, have that conversation with them. Be like, you know what? I'm on board and I'm wigging out about this. Like, what if this happens? And, and that might be a conversation you have. I was chatting to some guys, um, my friend actually ahead of their home birth and something that I wish I did in the first one and did a little bit in the second one was develop an independent relationship with our midwife. Ooh, like opened that. up that line of communication so I could give her a call and be like, yo, this is what's coming up for me. Like, what can I do? Is this normal? Like, huge tip. And yeah, honestly, because um, then it's not burdening our partner as well and projecting onto them because they're going through their own process, which is huge. And so that's a really important part of it. So structured support learning and understanding the physiology of birth, especially if you are going to do um, a home birth, that'll help give lots of confidence. Understanding and really owning the fears or concern that you're bringing to the space. Because in my opinion, the only role of the guy is to, other than the practical stuff, which is super important, like because you want to just remove headspace from, create headspace for your partner so that she can surrender and just do her thing. So anything in the environment and then part of that is what you're bringing. So if part of you is like, we're probably going to transfer and that's a thought you have, I'd work on that. You, you Like don't be bringing that into the space um, and get the whatever support you need to, to work through that because it will show up. Like it's a, yeah, it will show up. Under pressure capacity. and under, yeah. I want to say tension, but under complete helplessness. Yeah. Surrender is something that we are typically not amazing at as men. No, <laughs> we don't, don't like know. that. We like control. We, women aren't that good. <laughs> I know. Yeah. yeah I know. We're getting better. Uh, we're, all, we're all on a, this, you know, personal yeah. development program called life about learning to surrender. Yeah. Um, this is great. I love your tip about doing things together mm-hmm. and having an independent contact with your birth support, whatever that birth support is, mm-hmm. because I feel often it's really put on the female to do yep the research to find the person. And, and of yep. course, I personally feel it's more important that the female fully trusts oh my God, that yes. person than the man. But yep. at the same time, you it's important to both be on the same page. And Brenton was very similar to you. You know, we have, yep. we've, we've got a, um, we intend to for a home birth. Yep. And um, he was like, well, you're the one that knows about your body. Like if that feels good for your body and that's what's going to be best, then okay. He's like, do I get a midwife? I was like, babe, the midwife is for you. Like yeah. that's why we have two midwives there. Yeah. Um, but I think the the independent contact is really good because there are fears that everybody will have in that space because it's so unknown and everyone's mm-hmm. experience is so different. But the doing things together is great. And something I I just want to share is that Brent and I right now are listening to the fourth trimester book mm-hmm. by Kimberly Ann Johnson. Nice. And 
because I could tell him all the things I want him to be able to do in the fourth trimester, but it's so much better if it comes from somebody else. Oh. And I wanted to listen to the book and I started and I, I said to him, oh, would you be open to listening to this chapter with me? He's like, let's just listen to the book. And I was like, okay. And so mm-hmm. that gives us that, I you know, that time together. So when we're making dinner, we will, we won't talk. We'll just listen to the book together and mm-hmm. we'll just do a chapter at a time, you know, maybe mm-hmm. you know, one every two or three days. Yeah. And it means that at the end of each chapter, we get to sit and reflect. So what did you learn? What did I learn? You know, mm-hmm. like, what are you unsure about? Do you think we should do something differently? Mm-hmm. And um, that's made my decision to hire a postpartum doula because mm-hmm. I know I'm not good at the asking for help part. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've already asked for help. Preempted that. Well played. I've learned, I've learned my wounds and I know that's one of those wounds. So um, he was like, but why do we need that? Like I can do all of that. And yeah, so, so the thing that I've learned, and this is the whole part of giving birth at a, at a later stage in life at 37 is that I'm like, but babe, the only time that you are going to have dedicated to just adapting to fatherhood mm-hmm. is between birth. And when you decide to go back to work. Mm-hmm. And how, how much time do you want to adapt is that was my question. Cause he's like, Oh, I might take one or two weeks off. And I was like, fuck you will like in my mind, in my mind. Right. I didn't say that. Cue and the I, chapter that says take more than fucking two weeks off. Exactly. Cue that <laughs> yeah. like press play there. Um, if only you could tab audiobooks. but yeah, yeah. You know, and I just said, okay, well, you know, I understand that that's probably what you're thinking is the right thing to do. And that you might be thinking that because other people, you know, have taken that much time off. Oh, I can't I imagine said, but, only having that amount of time. Right? But I was like, yeah. but to know that that's the only time that you get just uninterrupted. Mm-hmm. To, uh, yeah. Like and, how much and, would you like? So he's and, like at least six weeks now. I'm like, yes. Amazing. So it's not about the money. Like we could be eating rice. I don't give a yeah. fuck. Right. And, it's about that connection. So good. And, and it, it speaks into like what I shared about the hormonal changes in men for bonding and that, that requires time. So if you don't have the time, that doesn't happen. Guess what? If you're less connected to the baby, guess what? You're less able to regulate the baby. So that becomes more of a burden on mum mm. later down the track. And so all these little decisions that we're making now fundamentally impact things like later down the track. And you could probably make the case, right? That, okay, I'm going to take an extra four weeks off work. Okay, that means this much less money. I would argue that you'll end up making significantly more than that amount of money a year later because of enhanced productivity, because of harmony in the home. Like it's, it's this time is, and give yourself the gift. It's like your child. Like it's, it's. Never going to get that back. Yeah. And it, it's the going, speaking to the doula thing, because we had a doula as well at the birth and, got postpartum support as part of that. And even in the birth, because we didn't have a doula for our second birth, but we did for our first. And to be honest, it was more for me. Kat was like, what do you reckon? And I'm like, I am keen. Because I need this. Timing things, messaging the midwife, filling up the thing, reheating the thing, all of that. I didn't have to do that. So guess what I got to do? Be obsessively 100% present with Kat in her process and holding mm. space. And I could just be there with her. So it was like, it's, yeah, that, that, that allure of I can do that. I can just do that. I can heat up that. I can do that. I can cook for you. I'll be off work. I can do that. It goes back to that receptivity. Just because you can doesn't mean that's the best option for you totally. and the family unit. Something I want to add to that, that I'm sure you've seen this time round, having your second versus your first and this is because I've learned this from many other parents who have had one, two or three children is that, you know, I'm taking two months, maybe a little bit more off before I even enter the birth portal, Mm -hmm. because I know that's going to be my last ever time until I'm, you know, in 20 years time where it's just me, you know, I can just do my own fucking thing. And so I've also said to Brenton and reflected to him that when we go through postpartum, let's say we do four postpartums with four babies and we have four kids is that every time I'm still with the baby and I'm still caring for the baby, but what are you doing? You now have one child already to care for whilst I'm caring for a baby in your second birth. And then the third birth, you've got two kids to look after and I've got one. And so, so gnarly. The first, the first 
is that's the only time as I feel, and I've not been there yet. So correct me if I'm off the cards because you've done this twice now, is that for a father, that's the only time of uninterrupted experience of newborn where you're Mm -hmm. not caring for someone else apart from just your baby and your partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can't get that back. It's so wildly different. Like my experience of that postpartum, the bubble, so to speak, postpartum bubble. Because I, after Rafi was born, who's my firstborn, I didn't leave the house for two weeks because we had food delivered. We had like, so I was in the birth pool with Kat when Rafi was born. So I was literally in the bubble. And this second time around, um, I wasn't in the pool because Rafi was asleep in the room next door. So I'm like, I'm holding space for him as well. And then I was, I left the house to take him for a drive so he could have a nap seven hours after Ren was born. So I broke the bubble within 24 hours and I pretty much left the house to go to a park every day after that. So my experience, yeah, of that bonding. And again, I've felt the difference uh, in terms of like the hormones and the level of presence. Like it's, it's, you feel like, especially during the birth, but even postpartum, it's like trippy. It's like you're on a low dose of mushrooms or something like it's, whereas I didn't really feel that this second time. So, yeah, you're right. That first time is an incredibly unique opportunity. And that time I had with Rafi in that time definitely contributed to the connection we have, um, the ability I had to settle him and him to be able to just sleep with me and, and all these different things. And it made those first couple of years so much more harmonious for us as a family because I've spoken to guys who didn't have that, like, financially wise or just their job or whatever only took a week off or went FIFO or whatever didn't get that and then you get 18 months down the track and baby only wants mum dad can't do anything it's so you feel helpless because mum's just cooked after 18 months of that and so it's it's yeah that it just allows you to provide going back to provide provide so much more for your family than what that if you have the ability that like month's worth of income or whatever, that's going to seem irrelevant compared to the bonds that you're forming and, and what's happening in those, those early weeks. It's like the MasterCard ad priceless. Yeah. Like you, can't, you, you, like you just can't put a figure on it. And that's why when I hired our postpartum doula, Liz, who's a great friend of mine, trained in traditional Chinese medicine, Ar- Ayurveda, mm. all the things I love is that I was like, babe, we don't have to do the things. Like you don't have like, yes, please give me a massage. But like yes. she's coming to do that. She's coming to change our bed yes. sheets. You know, oh she's bringing God. some meals so that just good. helps with, you know, and I, for me, I, I, I know that that's a priceless expense. And some people say, oh, you're so fortunate. I said, actually, no, I'm not fortunate. Like that's a import, that's a priority for me. Mm-hmm. And so I'm making it a priority regardless of the cost. Mm-hmm. So yep. I think it's just important to look at those incremental times of importance and what does that really mean to you and how does that stand out for you? And like I said, in hindsight, if I was birthing at 27, my experiences would have been very different Mm -hmm. than what they are now. And so I'm always like, there's pros and cons to birthing at different ages in your life and by your community and who, like what you learn from them. And, you know, if it wasn't for my best friend, Amber, who you know very well Mm -hmm. too, if she wasn't like Gemma, enjoy every little moment you get to yourself. Go on a holiday, just you for a weekend. Mm, mm. Stay in an Airbnb. Who cares if it costs you $3,000? Just go and get that because I see how important those moments are for her. Hence why I take her son so often so mm-hmm. she can get those moments. And I know that once I've had a child, those moments are going to be harder for me to have for her. Yeah. So for quite it's a while. just this, yeah, it's just this you know, understanding of community and learning from each other, but being willing to learn from somebody Mm -hmm. else as opposed to, you know, Mr. or Mrs. Know-it-all. Yeah. I got this worked out. I read these four books. Oh, oh my, like, I feel like the motto for fatherhood or probably parenthood is like, welcome to fatherhood. I hope you like the taste of humble pie because it's just, if you are not, if you don't have a learner's mindset and, and you just get humbled so often. And so I think that's a great call, like being willing to learn. And at the same time, don't let everything in, especially if you're on social media or you've just got friends or people that are offering unsolicited advice, feel free to like close the door. If you feel contracted or worse about your parenting or whatever, like, yeah, be, find expanders, find expanders. Yeah. And you can do that through podcasts. You listen to chats like this or or whatever, like they don't have to be 
friends that live next door, but like find expanders of what's possible in alignment with the way you know it can be. Yeah. Like I knew it could be an amazing experience and I knew it could be the best year of our life, even though when the examples I sort of knew personally, it wasn't. It was the most challenging year of their life. And I was like, I know somebody in the billions of people have had a good time in their first year. You know what I mean? Like if it's possible. And so just, yeah, inviting that in. Um, yeah, I think is really important as well. And being willing to be different to the norm. I yeah, think, yeah. You know, and oh, this is good. This particularly is good. with um, I'm cautious of time because we could ran on these topics forever. Yeah, yeah. I've being, got one more thing at a, a different topic okay, I cool. need to circle back to as well. Okay, cool. Um, but being okay with being different to the norm, and I think, you know, personally for me, choosing home birth as our preference and that being the first for Brendan and anybody that he knows, not the first in people I know, but first in my family Mm -hmm. is that that can make a lot of other people uncomfortable. And so I'm always like, well, are they going to be there? Are they doing the thing? Like it's only the team who are doing the thing that it really matters for. And I think that also comes back to like your circle of influence. And so I get asked quite often like, oh, you know, have you listened to the Australian birthing stories podcast? Have you, what books have you read? I'm reading Spiritual Mood with Free, mm-hmm. um, Reclaiming Childbirth. I think it is the, the Red Book. Um, and I'm not listening to any podcast episodes. This is the audio book, fourth mm-hmm. trimester is, is pretty much it because I already feel quite capable in my body. I don't want to be dampened about other people's stories that I've never even brought into my consciousness before. And so I think we sometimes can over-prepare, which can also bring in more challenge. Mm-hmm. So being yeah. okay being different, you know, the same as like, we aren't sharing our birthday, like our birth date, our due date, because mm-hmm. we have a birth season because yeah. the baby could come at any fucking time. Like the baby will and come it, when the baby's ready. And so and you start getting those messages from family, totally like, baby here. Yeah. And, and it's like, I think okay. I'd probably send you a message if we'd had the baby. Like, yeah, stop. I think you would hear from us. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But also I always say um, when, you know, cause I've definitely been asked by some people about, Oh, when do you or just tell us, you know, when's mm. the due date? And I'm like, what are you going to do with that information? Once you know it, like, are you going to be at the door as a mm-hmm. cheerleader, cheerleading me on at that particular date? Like, I don't think so. Yeah. Unless you're part of the birth team or yes. have specifically put your hand up to deliver something at a certain time post birth mm-hmm. because of the care that you're providing. Like there's really no need for that. Like, yeah. yeah. The baby's 100%. going to be in your life for the rest of your life. You can give mm-hmm. up for like give up give up ownership a little bit, you know, yeah. for a few weeks. Anyway, back to you. What you were going to share? Um, cool. So two things. One's really quick on that, um, like having expanders and stuff. Something that I found wildly helpful was watching birth videos, home birth videos. Um, and so I'll put my hand up and say I didn't go and source these like Kat did on Instagram and Vimeo, like she's had this whole list. It wasn't your top Google search? No, it wasn't. Um, But that, I found that, and and it's funny because like we binged about seven birth videos the night we went into labor, like in terms of like we went to bed and we were just watching all these amazing birth experiences. And then six hours later, Kat's water's broken, labor started. And that- The oxytocin was flowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that really helped normalize because babies would come out and I'm like, that baby looks dead. Like it's blue and like all of like all of these different things that cords around its neck three times. Yeah, is that I would have. It's like, not breathing. It's not screaming. Bro- it's yeah. So that was actually super important in retrospect um, for me because it just normal normalized so many things that can happen in that space. Um, so yeah, if you have the ability as as a guy like do that and do, again it can be something that's great to do together mm. um so that was the the one thing the other thing that we didn't talk about we spoke a lot about sort of like money and working and time off and, and all of these different things and different aspects of providing the other big hurdle postpartum is intimacy and having conversations about this and being uh open and willing to move through the evolution of intimacy is hugely important um and again i I know we've been ranting for a bit already and we're probably looking to wrap up but i just couldn't let the conversation finish without at least dropping that bomb in there but very grateful for the guys what happens a so a just get good at talking about that make a plan 
be open to the fact that it changes. Um, what basically in essence, what happens is if you're in a heterosexual relationship, the woman, all of her feminine, nurturing, delicious energy that we just love as men, we get it all. Like obviously they have some for themselves and, and all of that, but it's like primarily that's directed at us. Baby's born. All of that is now directed to baby as it should be. And so guys, a lot of the time are a bit like, what the fuck? Like, not out of a like, what are you doing? But it's 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 a shock to our system because it's such an it's an important yeah. nutrient that we don't realize we're getting, especially if we've been in relationship for a while, and then all of a sudden it's not there. And then we go to get some of it, and our partner's touched out and doesn't want to be intimate, even non sexually or, or whatever. And it can be hugely challenging for guys. And so understanding that's a natural progression, and using it as a way to start. Um, exploring internally our own relationship to sex and sexuality, pleasure, intimacy, what that means to us, how we get it, um, all of these different things is a really important part of the process because going back to all the things that we spoke about before that can build resentment, this is a huge one as well. Um, And it's compounding, right? It's compounding. The more resentment there is, the less openness to intimacy there is. And it's like, oh, it can really lead to a not a good spot. Um, And so normalizing any struggles that happen, healing, physical, mental, emotional healing, like your partner is birthing a baby that will not be the same in any way, shape or form. Physically, um, spiritually, they'll be a different woman and find different things pleasurable and it's all going to change. Some stuff might not change, but be open to the fact that it could just be completely different. The type of sex she want to, she wants to have, all of this stuff, is probably going to change. And so there's this unconscious want to get back to where we were. You're never going back there because you went with a different woman now. And so it's as a team, how can we communicate and talk about what it looks like moving forward? Mm. What do we want to create now? Not recreate what we had. Like, what does that get to look like? And in the pockets of the time that we get, you know, like there's so many, that could be a whole podcast in and of itself. So I'll leave it at that. But I just wanted to make sure that was included in this conversation because it trips a lot of guys up and they don't know what to do about it. And I think that's a great conversation to have with another male because 100% like back to what we were discussing earlier about, Hey, this is a universal experience and you're not the only person that's experiencing this particular shift and change. And I think, it's the same with women. You know, I grew up in a society, well, maybe we grew up in the same society, but I grew up in a community <laughs> um, that didn't talk about sex at all. You know, it was like mm. the sealed section of the Dolly magazine, you know, like that was it. <laughs> um, but having that conversation is really important. And I think having friends who are at the level who are willing to have those kinds of conversations, I think is also really important too. And yeah, I love that you've brought this to light because you know, it's just another one of those conversations that's not often had. And so at least people can be really aware of it. And I think most people can clue into that in the pregnancy experience leading into the birth. I know that's been it for me. And I've Mm -hmm. definitely gone through phases where I'm like, I don't have anything to give to myself, let alone to anybody else. Don't touch me. Don't even look at me. (laughs) Yeah. And that like, I feel disgusting in my body and like, oh, my nipples are like five times the size. And Mm -hmm. it's just, um, I think being really open and express ex, expressing how you're feeling and the changes that are going on and then asking, I'm very good at asking Brenton, Hey babe, how are you feeling about the fact that we haven't had sex in a month? Because I've just been so nauseous that even when you push me with your finger, I feel sick, let alone anything else you push mm-hmm. me with. Mm-hmm. Um, I think having those, <laughs> having those conversations is really healthy too. So thanks mm-hmm. for bringing that up. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. It's and pregnancy. Yeah, it can go either way. Like, yeah, it can do for different things for arousal. Some people are like, don't touch me, don't come near me. And others I know in different phases. Like totally. I've been there through. were certain, yeah, yeah, where it's like, can't get enough. And I'm like, what is going on here? Um, this is can't madness. Keep up. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, just, yeah, just approaching it with an open mind, um, an open heart, and being willing to talk about it. And, get excited about it because my experience of it, it gets better. If you create the space for it, it's like it gets better. And then with two, it gets better. Um, It's different, but it's like there's a new depth available. Um, 
and connection to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's an important part of the equation that definitely needs to be addressed. So beautiful. Thank you. How can all of our listeners, I could just, you know, we could keep talking, but how yes. can all of our listeners find out and learn more about you? Um, what's the best channels for them? To um, do? Best spot, like, yeah, Instagram. Um, that's where I share a lot of my men's stuff and couple stuff. Um, and then my podcast, Thriving Fatherhood. Um, and that's got, I think, 40% of my listeners for that are women. Um, mm-hmm. So it's a conversation around fatherhood primarily, um, but ben- clearly beneficial for lots of women too because there's lots that keep listening to it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, those are two resources. Um, and if you want to, yeah, work more closely with me, I've got a, a men's program that's going to kick off just before the end of this year. Um, and then, yeah, the couples program will be have another intake early next year. So, yeah, there are, and I've got heaps of free resources in terms of free workshops and stuff. So, yeah, if you go to my Instagram, you'll, you'll find all that. Mm, I'll put all of those links in the show notes. Tally, you've gone over and beyond. Thank you so much in the time frame that you have with two young children already. So thank you so much for being here and sharing about the transitions to fatherhood and what we can do to really support fathers become amplified, you know, energetic, loving, compassionate fathers for themselves and for others. Um, It means a lot. So thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for tuning into every episode of the Well Woman podcast. For everything we mentioned in today's episode, you can find this in the show notes over at wellsome.com forward slash podcast. If this episode excited you, please hit follow on Spotify, which means all of my episodes will pop up in your feed weekly so you never miss a weekly drop. I'd love you to leave a review on Apple Podcasts too. Love this episode? Come and follow me over on Instagram at wellsome underscore Gemily. Say hi and share what you've taken away from this episode with me. Now, is there a bestie, sister, or a friend who you know who might be fed up, frustrated, and confused with their cycles? Are they ready to join you in awakening their cyclical essence too? Well, take a screenshot of this podcast episode, share it on your socials, email it, text it, or any way you need to get it to them. So together, we can all live in flow, harmony, and balance with our cycles. Now, until next time, beautiful, get connected, listen to your body, and remember, body confidence all begins with living in tune with your menstrual cycle.